Welcome to the Wisdom That Breathes channel. Across all our platforms, we try to share wisdom which is relevant and accessible to everyone. But on this particular platform, we go deeper into some of the ancient principles found within the scriptures. If you find some of the terminology difficult or inaccessible, then go over to our Keshava Swami YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other content which is perhaps more relatable. Thank you and enjoy the wisdom that breathes. Thank you so much for coming this morning. So today we're reading from the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. We're reading from the Madhya Lila. Chapter number 9 entitled Lord Chaitanya's Travels to the Holy Places. And today we're reading from text number 301 to 305. So 305 is on the board. Yes. So I'll just read uh, 301 to 304 myself and then we'll go from <coughs> 301. Prabhu Gohe Purva Shrame Ten Hamora Bhata Jagannatha Mishra Purva Shrame Mora Pita. Translation Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, in my previous ashram, Shankararanya was my brother and Jagannath Mishra was my father. Ei mata dui jane ishra gosti kari dwaraka dekhila chailala shri rangapuri After finishing his talks with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sri Rangapuri started for Dwaraka Dham. Dinachari tatha prabhuke rakila brahmana bhimanadi shnanakori karena vithala darshana After Sri Rangapuri departed for Dwarka, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu remained with the brahmana at Pandarapura for four more days. He took his bath in the Bhima river and visited the temple of Vithal. <coughs> Rabbi Mahaprabhu Aila Krishna Vinvati Re Nana Tirta Dikekara Devata Mandire Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu next went to the bank of the Krishna Venga River where he visited many holy places and the temples of the various gods. Short purport This river is a branch of the river Krishna. It is said that Thakur Bilgamango resided on the banks of this river which is also called the Dhima, the Vaini, the Sina, and the Dhima. So now we can do a response to Dhima. <coughs> Brahmana Samaja Sabha Vaishnava Charita 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 Sakale Pade, Krishna Karanam Rita, Vishnava Sakala Pade, Krishna Karanam Rita, Vishnava Sakala Pade, Krishna Karanam Rita, Vishnava Sakala Pade, Krishna Karanam Rita, Ramana Samaja Sabha, Vishnava Charita, 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 Sakala Pade, Krishna Karanam Rita, Vaishnava Sakala Pade, Krishna Karanam Rita, Sakala Pade, Krishna Karanam Rita, Vaishnava Sakala Pade, Krishna Karanam Rita. Krishna Karanam Rita Vaishnava Sakala Pade Krishna Karanam Rita 
Brahmana Samaja Sabha Vaishnava Charita Brahmana Samaja Sabha Vaishnava Charita Vaishnava Sakalapade Krishna Karnamrita Vaishnava Sakalapade Krishna Karnamrita Krishna Karanamrita, which was composed by Bilva Mangal Thakur. This book was composed by Bilva Mangal Thakur in 112 verses. There are two or three other books bearing the same name, and there are also two commentaries on Bilva Mangal's book. One commentary was written by Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami and the other by Chaitanya Das Goswami. Shri Prabhu Bhavi Ki Jai. Om Ajnana Timirana Dasya Jnana Jnana Shivakaya Chakshuri Kamiya Asmai Shri Guru Venama Shri Chaitanya Nobishtam Sabitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dhati Svapurantikam Vandeyam Shri Guru Shri Vapadamadam Shri Guru Vaishnavamsha Shri Rupam Sarjahatam Sadhana Dhamma Dhamitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Sadhutam Parajana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Yadavya Krishna Padam Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's travels in South India are about giving, but they're also about receiving. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is giving association, he's giving inspiration, he's giving knowledge. But Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is also very, very interested in receiving association, 
receiving inspiration, receiving uh, knowledge also. And so here in this pastime, we're seeing that Mahaprabhu has stopped in a certain place and he is very eager to receive. I guess when I read this, this is the first thing that came to my mind, that in a devotee's life, they are always giving and receiving. The moment you think you don't need to receive anymore, then you are spiritually dead. The rhythm of life is to breathe out and then to breathe in. And if someone thinks, I've breathed in in so many years, now I should just breathe out. Then that signifies the end of life. So Mahaprabhu is a sannyasi, he's a preacher, he is seen as a leader of society, but he is also in the mood of receiving. Yes, he must give knowledge, but sometimes he also wants to hear knowledge. When a sannyasi ends up at a temple, they generally give all the classes. <laughs> I've noticed. <laughs> and Mahaprabhu comes to the Godavari, and you can imagine, everyone is there. You're only here for a few days. You are a sannyasi. You are moving. We don't know when we'll see you again. You should speak. No, no, Mahaprabhu said, I have come here to hear. I have come here to listen. No, no, we may not see you. No, no, I will hear. I will ask the questions. And then he puts Ramananda Rai in the hot seat. He says, I will ask you the questions. So always receiving a Matra Bhakta Bhav Goriyangi Kal. Mahaprabhu is coming to show the Bhakta Bhav, the emotion of a devotee. So a devotee should never think I've received enough. Always eager. Yes. Srila Prabhupada was throwing some Mahaprasad remnants out to the ducks. And they recognized he was giving one duck extra remnants. So one devotee said, Why? Prabhupada said, because he's quacking the loudest. <laughs> yes. Asha Bandha Samutkantha Namagane Sadaruji Ashaptistad Gunakyane Samutkante, yes, always eager. Uh, always a student. It's interesting, one of Srimati Radharani's names is Vidyarthi. Very beautiful name. It means uh, she who is always seeking to learn more, to know more. So Mahaprabhu is looking, he's looking to find some treasures in South India. What can I do to nourish my devotion? What can I do to nourish my movement? And so he comes to this very, very famous place, Krishna, uh, the river Venva, in other places it's said Vena, whatever it may be. And this river is very, very famous because a great saint lived there. Yes, Bilva Mangal Thakur. And because Bilva Mango Thakur had lived there, he was the local saint, he was the local boy. So naturally everyone there was focused on Bilva Mango Thakur, and Bilva Mango Thakur wrote a book, Krishna Karan Amrita. So naturally, because he was the local saint, everyone was reading that book. Everyone was immersed in that book, because we are naturally attracted uh, to a local saint. <coughs> Like I was drawn to Sridi Dharma Prabhu because he was a great devotee, but also because he was from Wembley. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, someone from Wembley can make it. <laughs> so we are drawn. We are drawn if there is a local person, very close, is close to us. So naturally there is an attraction there. So Mahaprabhu comes to this river Venva and everyone there is uh, studying Krishna Karana Rita. Here, Kaviraj Goswami says it was a community of Brahmanas. But they were all pure devotees. He makes the uh, strategic point in the verse to remind us if you ain't a pure devotee, maybe you're not ready for Krishna Karana Rita. Um, so they were studying this book, and uh, when Mahaprabhu came there, then naturally he was attracted. Oh, Krishna Karanam Rita is very beautiful. Krishna Karanam Rita is very, you know, like in colloquial English, if someone says something very nice, then we say it's music to my ears. So Krishna Karanam Rita literally means like the music to Krishna's ears, or the nectar which is filling Krishna's ears. 
So can you imagine Bill Vamongo Thakur was so powerful that he wrote something that even Krishna was relishing. That's real, that's powerful, that's amazing. Um, so, Bill Vamongo Thakur, his story is incredible. Srila Prabhupada talked about his story many, many times. And no matter how many times we hear it, it's like it's so incredibly instructive. Bilga Mangal Thakur became like a hero. In the Bhagavatam, actually, if you read in the fourth canto, it's easy to remember. I call it the hero's purport. 4.25.25. In the Puranjana story, Prabhupada writes this whole purple on what it means to be a hero. And Prabhupada writes in that purple that there are two types of hero in the material world. One type of hero is a hero in the material field. But the other type of hero is a hero in the spiritual field. One who has mastered their mind and senses. That person becomes uh, a more exalted hero. And so Bilba Mangotako's story is incredibly powerful because it shows how he went from being a hero in the material sense, enjoying like anything, to being a hero in the spiritual sense, like completely controlling his mind and his senses and uh, completely then reaching uh, his spiritual potential. Controlling the mind and senses is incredibly important. There's no uh, progress in spiritual life unless we control our mind and senses. Like we talk about the Goswamis of Vrindavan as the masterminds of bhakti. And when I think about the masterminds of bhakti, to me it says three things. They're masterminds because number one, they've mastered their own mind. But number two, because they've mastered their own mind, they fully internalize the mind of their master. And because they fully internalize the mind of their master, they can masterfully reach the mind of any living entity. That is the progress. First, you have to master your own mind. And then you can know the master's mind. And once you know the master's mind, you can reach anyone's mind. And therefore the Goswamis of Vrindavan, they began, they mastered their own mind. And then Sri Chaitanya Mano Pishtam, they fully understood Mahaprabhu's innermost desire. And then they just wrote things which just moved and transformed people. And Bilba Mangal Thakur was perhaps the exact same trajectory of Sadhu. He mastered his own mind and then he fully understood the mind of Krishna and then he wrote down the mind of Krishna in Krishna Karanamrita and then he gave it to the world so that those who are Rasika Bhaktas can have their own mind moved by those words which were penned by the master mind who had understood his master's mind. So Bilba Mangotaku is an incredible personality there was an American writer, his name was Joseph Campbell. And what he did is he studied uh, religions, he studied theologies, he studied all the Hollywood movies, and he studied uh, all the heroic journeys in this world. And then he came up with something called the hero's journey. And he said that if you look in history, anyone who became a hero went through a particular journey. And maybe it was different in different people's situation, but the elements of every hero's journey in this world, um, whether it's a religious hero or a political hero or a, a you know, a entertainment hero, if there's such a thing, um, they all went through a certain trajectory in their life. He said the first thing that happens in the hero's journey is there is a call to adventure. Something will happen in that person's life which calls them to look for something more, to endeavor for something higher. And then he says the next thing that happens in the hero's journey 
is there is supernatural aid. Someone will come to help them, to guide them, to instruct them, to show them the path forward. And then he says, the next element is the threshold. And that's the point where the hero goes from what they know to what they don't know. They make a journey into the unknown to take a step into an uncomfortable zone in order to find their calling. And then he says the next thing that happens in a hero's journey is that there are distractions and there are temptations and there are obstacles. And then he says if the hero continues on, then what happens after some time is that there is a revelation, there's a gift, there's an incredible um, attainment that that hero uh, achieves. And then he says the final thing that happens in a hero's journey is then they come back into the world to share that gift with the world. And he says, if you look at any uh, incredible personality, then they went through these stages. So it's kind of pretty amazing, because if you look at even our Shastra, it's quite accurate. If you look at the Supreme Lord, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then you can map Mahaprabhu's journey in that way. If you look at the great saints of the Bhagavatam, whether it be Narad Muni or Dev Dhruva Maharaj or Ajamil, you can map the same stages. Even if you look at our contemporary Acharyas, Srila Prabhupada or Bhaktivinoda Thakur, you can map the exact same stages. And if you look at the life of Bilva Mangal Thakur, you see the exact same stages. Because the first thing that happens in Bilba Mangal Thakur's journey is that there's a call to adventure. Something happens which makes him realize, I will change my life. And what was that? It was explained that Bilba Mangal Thakur, although born in a very, very pious family, somehow or other got attached to seeing a prostitute. And her name was Chintamani. Amazing name for a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> so he said that he would go to see Chintamani every single day without fail. That's how attached he was. And here Mahaprabhu is walking on the river Venva and he said that Chintamani, she was on one side of the river and Bilba Mangal Thakur was on the other side of the river. So every day when Bilba Mangal Thakur would want to go and see her, he would take a boat from one side of the river to the other. And then it's mentioned that his call to adventure came. Because on one particular day, it happened to be the day when he was doing the funeral rites for his own father. And as he was doing the funeral rites for his own father, he was so enamored. He was, his mind was so much hijacked by sense gratification that when he was doing the funeral rites for his father, he was telling the priest, Jaldi, Jaldi, finish it up quickly. I know you need to go and see her. Time is going. Some, sometimes nowadays people do yagyas and the people tell them, just shortcut, shortcut, just get it done. The time is going. So, so Bilba Mangal Thakur, can you imagine? He was doing the funeral rites for his father and he was telling the priest to speed it up. I need to go and see Chintamani. That was what was on his mind. I'd become so enamored. And then it's explained after the uh, ceremony for his father, there was a great feast feeding all the brahmanas, feeding all the sadhus because that's very, very auspicious. So what did Bilba Mangal Thakur do? He took some tiffins and he saved it because he thought, I'll give it to Chintamani, the prostitute, when I go and meet her tonight. The feast that was meant for all the sadhus he was taking there. So you can immediately begin to see from his behavior that in colloquial English he had kind of lost it. He had lost the plot. And then the time came to go. And it's explained that a huge storm broke out. No one in their right mind would go. But Bilba Mangal Thakur was not in his right mind. He was definitely not a mastermind at this point. <laughs> 
And so he began walking to the bank of the river Venba, <coughs> thinking, no, no, I must see her. Whatever it takes, I will go. And he reached the bank of the river Venba, and there was no boatman. Because after all, on such a stormy night, what kind of person would want to come? There's no business. So no one would be there. But Bill Bamango Thakur was there, and there was no boatman. But he was looking on the other side of the river, thinking, I've got to reach. And so he said, I'll just swim. I'll just do it. I'll swim. I can do it. So he began swimming. I don't know if he was a good swimmer or not. But it's explained that at one point he was swimming, the rain was getting uh, heavier, the winds were getting stronger, and the waves were getting higher, and he began to drown. He was drowning. And he wasn't thinking about saving his life, he was thinking about getting to Chintamani. And in the midst of drowning, it said that he hung on to a log. You know, stay afloat, somehow or other. And he grabbed onto this, uh, in the dark of night, onto this log, and somehow he made it to the other side of the river. And then as he got to the other side of the river and kind of picked himself up onto the shore, he looked and he realized, oh my God, it was a corpse. I grabbed hold of a corpse. But I was so fixed in my mind on my goal that I didn't even realize the crazy thing that I was holding on to. Shocking. Once I was in Jagannath Puri, and I somehow got up really early, so I was trying to go to Puri Temple, but it was very, very dark. There was no lights. So I walked towards a uh, place where there was some, some men around the fire warming their hands, so I went past there. And as soon as I went past the fire, I went, oh my God, there was a burning corpse in the fire. And I realized that I'd walked into a crematorium. I mean, it was absolutely shocking. It was the most, one of the most shocking things in my life, you know? And they were just kind of warming their hands. <laughs> 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 so, so Babi Ramangutaru, he was not moved. It was not shocking for him anyway. It was a corpse, but his mind was on Chintamani. So then he began walking to Chintamani's house. Now, Chintamani, she was thinking, I mean, he's not going to come today. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's raining like anything. I mean, there's no way he wouldn't even be able to get across because there's no boatman. So Chintamani, she had gone to sleep. She had bolted the door and she went to sleep. She thought, he's not going to come today. But Bill Mangotaku came. And then he got to her house and he tried to open the door, but it was bolted. He said, no, how can it be bolted? So then he began shouting, Chintamani, Chintamani. But the thunder and the sound of the rain and the howling wind meant that Chintamani couldn't hear anything. So he was shouting, Chintamani, Chintamani, but no one, no one, you know. So then he thought, I've got to climb over. So he's in the dark, he was looking, how will I climb over this wall? The, the door is bolted. See, oh, there's a rope, let me grab hold of it. So he grabbed hold of the rope, he got to the top, he realized, oh my God, it's not a rope, it's a snake. <laughs> Completely oblivious to anything and everything. And as he got to the wall, I don't know if he fell because of the snake or what happened, but he got to the top of the wall and then he fell onto the other side. So he hit the ground with a thud. And as he hit the ground with a thud, somehow or other, Chintamani woke up. And then Chintamani thought, who is that? So she came down. And as she came down, and then she walked into the courtyard, in the downpour of rain, completely disheveled, uh, just looking like a complete, like a, what Prabhupada would say, a vagabond. <laughs> She looked at him and she said, you came? He said, I had to come. I had to come to see you. And in that moment, Chintamani gave him the prophetic words. She said, you're so determined for sense gratification. 
If only you had this determination to attain Krishna, you would be an angel. And those words became the prophetic words, the call to adventure, that Bilba Bango Thakur in that moment realized, oh my God, what have I done? If I had that kind of determination for Krishna, I'd be so advanced. So it's such a profound instruction that Chintanani gave to Bilba Bango Thakur. Like sometimes, People come to me and they say, how, how do you become determined in Krishna consciousness? How can you get determination for you? And I kind of look at them and I say, when you established yourself in this world, you climbed up the corporate ladder, you uh, you managed to save enough money to get a house, you brought up children, you achieved so many things in this world which already required determination. How you can tell me you don't have determination? Otherwise you wouldn't be sitting there with all the assets that you have. Why are you asking me, how can I be determined? If you didn't have determination, you couldn't achieve what you had achieved in your life. But can you now apply that same determination to Krishna consciousness. You already have it. You already know how to do it. You just have to apply it to Krishna. But somehow or other, our difficulty is that to apply determination in the material sphere is very natural. But to apply the same determination in Krishna consciousness, we have to think 100 times. That's our disease. Like I was just somewhere and one parent was telling me that, you know, it cost them 70,000 pounds to send their child for one year of education. Oh, oh like 70,000 pounds? Oh, like, yeah. And I was thinking for them to spend 70,000 pounds to send their child in education is just like, yeah, we just do that. But then to spend 70,000 pounds for Krishna, you have to think 100 times. <laughs> I'm not doing a fundraising pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Just making it clear. Well, you know, for someone to stay up at work till the early hours of the morning or the late hours of the night, if they're lucky. Just like, yeah, that's life. We do that all the time. I mean, that's what we do. <laughs> but to wake up in the morning at three o'clock, now that you have to think hundred times. <laughs> or if someone takes one year out of their um, corporate job to do a course to upskill themselves so that they can earn more money. It's like, yeah, that's what we do. But to take one year to go to Vrindavan to deepen your consciousness, to set you up for eternity. Oh no, that you have to think hundred times before you do can you see? Chintamani's words are so powerful. If only you had that determination for Krishna. Sometimes I ask myself, if I spent 10% of what I did in my material academic education, if I spent 10% of that effort to learn about Krishna, where I would be? It's amazing. So Bilga Mango Thakur just, he got it. He got it in that moment that I need to be determined. I need to just change my life around. And different versions say different things. Some say that he immediately went to Vrindavan. And other accounts say that he went to Somagiri. His instructing, uh, his initiating spiritual master was Somagiri. And he said that for one year he studied under Somagiri. And then eventually Somagiri told him, now it's time for you to go to Vrindavan. There's nothing left for you in this world. So then he got the supernatural aid. He got him. Bilba Mangotapa is incredible. In the beginning of Krishna Karanamrit, the very first line of his book, he says, Chinta Manir Jayati Somagiri Guru Me. In the very first line of his poem, 
He says, Chintamani Jayati, all glories to Chintamani. Soma Giri Guru May, but Soma Giri and Chintamani, they're my gurus. Yoga Mangal Thakur is so straightforward that at the beginning, the very first word of his masterpiece, his magnum opus, is he reveals to the world, I was going to a prostitute every single day. That's amazing. Like once we come to Krishna consciousness, we're like, we try to cover up the past. <laughs> 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 Are there, are there any skeletons in the closet? Uh, there's no skeletons in the closet to find for Bilga Mangal Thakur because he tells you straight up, Chintamani was my guru. Chintamani was your guru? That means you were going to a prostitute. Yeah, I was going to a prostitute. Nothing to hide. Saravata, A, Vaishnavatva. Simplicity is Vaishnavism. Straightforward. See? <laughs> It's very, very interesting. It's just very, very straightforward that, I mean, you know, at the beginning of a book, you're trying to develop faith in the author. It's like if someone comes up to give a talk and the MC introduces them, you generally try to say nice things that will give you faith to hear from this person. And they study that you see how. I don't know why that should give anyone faith. <laughs> but here, imagine you would introduce someone and you would say, and here is so and so. His guru was a prostitute. <laughs> well, maybe I should do another event. Should I be listening to this person? Look, the Mongol Tagore is so straightforward. He just says, this is who I am. He's going to a prostitute. And, um, and like this, then he began to go, he journeyed to Vrindavan. And then remember, when you journey into the unknown, then what happens is that there are distractions and there are deviations. So after Bilba Mangal Thakur had this change of heart and he decided, now I'm just going to go to Vrindavan, give everything up. Then on the way to Vrindavan, what happened? He stopped at a house. And in that house, he saw a lady. And she was very pious. She was a Brahmani, the wife of a Brahmana. And somehow or other, he became overcome by lusty desires again. So he began to follow her. So she was uh, tuned in. She could understand that he is attracted to me. So she was walking, walking. She saw, my God, he's following me. Stalk her. So she thought, let me just walk all the way home and bring him home. My husband will be there. So she brought him all the way to her house. So Bilga Mangal Thakur ends up there. So the Brahmini goes in and her husband is there, the Brahmana. So the Brahmana comes, he sees Bilga Mangal Thakur. He's so spiritually astute, he can understand what's in the heart and the mind of Bilga Mangal Thakur. So he says, what is it? I see that you're a renunciate. But I see that you have become enamored. What is on your mind? What is in your heart? And Bilga Mangal Thakur just tells him straight. He says, I want to embrace your wife. That was like, wow. There wasn't any beating around the bush. <laughs> he says, I want to embrace your wife. And the Brahmana, even more incredibly, looks back at Bilga Mangal Thakur and says, Oh, if that's what you wanted, why didn't you just tell me? I'll make all the arrangements. So the Brahmana goes to his wife and she says, he wants to embrace you. You dress yourself up. Amazing. And, he says, you, and then you go to him. Maybe he knew, I don't know. So she comes in front of Bilba Mangal Thakur. Bilba Mangal Thakur says, I want to enjoy it. She says, okay. And then in that moment, Bilva Mangal Thakur again realizes, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm going again down the same track. And then what does Bilva Mangal Thakur tell her? He says, I don't, it's okay. I don't want to enjoy it. But do me one thing. You see those pins in your hair? Give them to me. 
why you want the pins. Give me those pins. He takes the hairpins from this Brahmani. And in that moment, Bilva Mangal Thakur just points them to his eyes. Kills his eyes. He says, these eyes have diverted me throughout my life, deviated me from my purpose. I don't want these eyes anymore. And he blinds himself. That's one way to deal with sanctification. <laughs> <laughs> and then he continues on to Vrindavan as a blind man. There's a beautiful old movie of Bilba Mangal Thakur. You can see him walking as a blind man to Vrindavan on this journey to find Krishna. <coughs> and he said that as he gets closer and closer to Vrindavan, he doesn't know, he's blind. How to find my way? So he said, a cowherd boy comes to meet him, and he takes his hand. And as he takes his hand, he guides him into Vrindavan. So he's thinking, who is this cowherd boy? His hand is so soft. His association is so sweet. I can't see him, but I can smell him. I can feel him. I can sense his incredible energy. And then he reaches Vrindavan. And the boy says, now you're in Vrindavan. And the boy says, but now I have to go. My mother is calling me. No, no, how you can go? He tries to hang on to his hand. No, no, I have to go. My mother will be angry if I don't come back. So the boy starts walking away. And he says, you may, you may leave now, but I have imprisoned you in my heart. I have to see you again. Don't leave me. Of course, we learned that that boy was Krishna. And so then Bilba Mangal Thakur comes into Vrindavan. There's this amazing revelation of Krishna. Remember in the hero's journey, there's a revelation. And then it said that Bilba Mangal Thakur takes up residence at Brahma Kund. Brahma Kund is a very, very uh, significant place because it said this is the place where Brahmaji came after he had offended Krishna by stealing all the cows and the cowherd boys. And there Brahmaji cried. He cried so many tears that I have made so many mistakes in my life. And that Brahmakun came about from Brahmaji's tears of uh, repentance. So Bilba Mangal Thakur took up residence at Brahmakun. Of course, many, many great uh, things happened at Brahmakun. It's also said that Mirabai, when she came into Vrindavan, <clears throat> then the first night she spent was a night at Brahma Kund, a very, very powerful place. Of course, we know Rupa Goswami was also there, the deity of Rinda Devi was also discovered there. So, Brahma Mangal Thakur stayed there for many, many. Uh, he said that he lived for 700 years. Um, the dating of when he exactly was here is not fully known. And there, then, he wrote all of these uh, beautiful literatures, Krishna Karnamrita. And there, he wrote um, also many, many other songs. Rajaya Prashidam Lavani Pachauram Gopan Ganana Chabukola Chauram Maneka Jan Marjitapa Pachauram Chaura Gaganyam Purusham Namami. This beautiful prayer. Where he says, Krishna, you're a thief. You steal her, you stole the clothes of the gopis, you're stealing the butter, you're stealing away the sins of all the conditioned souls. Krishna, you're a thief, you've stolen away Radhika's heart. Krishna, you're a thief, you've stolen the luster of the dark, fresh rain cloud. Krishna, you're a thief because those who surrender unto you, you take away everything from them. He said, Krishna, you stole away everything. And because you're such a thief, I'm running behind you with the ropes of my love. And I've captured you with the ropes of my love. And I've imprisoned you within the dark uh, cell of my heart. And I'm not going to let you go. Very, very beautiful prayer by Bhilma Mangal Thakur. So here, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu comes to the river Vengva. And there he takes this book, the Krishna Karanamrita, 
which is very, very beautiful, uh, describing the very, very intimate details of Krishna's life, Krishna's heart, Krishna's interactions with his most confidential devotees. And in this way, Mahaprabhu is nourishing himself and he's nourishing the movement. Because ultimately, Mahaprabhu wants us to come and taste. Sometimes they say, do you uh, eat to live? Or do you live to eat? What do you think? Eat to live or live to eat? Eat to live? <laughs> That's what you we generally say. Gaudiya Vaishnava say no. <laughs> we don't eat to live. We live to eat. We live to taste. We live to relish. Because without rasa, there is no meaning to life. Yes, there are four kinds of food which are eaten. That which is sucked, that which is chewed, that which is licked, that which is drunk. But the rasika bhakta is also eaten four other types of taste. The four rasas. Dasya, Sakya, Vatsavya, Madhurya. And therefore, tasting Mohuraho, Rasika, Bhuvi Bhavuka. That one must one become a Rasika and taste. So Mahaprabhu wants everyone to taste the nectar of Krishna. Krishna Karana Amrita. So Mahaprabhu brought all of these things, made them available. Uh, but then the Question is, who is going to become qualified enough to taste? Because unless you become a connoisseur of bhakti, Krishna Karanamrita will remain very, very far away. And Krishna Karanamrita and the higher taste of Krishna cannot be relished unless one first becomes a master of their own mind and senses. And therefore, Bhilva Mango Thakur reminds us. First, become a master of your mind and senses. Then you will be able to understand the mind of the master. And then you will be able to do things, say things, write things, produce things, offer things to the world that will move people's minds, that will move people's <coughs> hearts. And this is why the saints are so valuable to us. Sadhu, Margan, Ugamanam, following the saints because they've learned how to live. Because living means you have to taste. And they're showing us how to taste what real life is. So here Mahaprabhu is really bringing Bilva Mango Thakur to the forefront. Bilva Mango Thakur may not be in the Gaudiya Sampradaya. Bilva Mango Thakur, is said, was actually a disciple of Vishnu Swami. He was in a different sampradaya and he had his journey. And so uh, Mahaprabhu is revealing it doesn't matter where one is tasting, where one has developed that purity of consciousness, then all of Krishna's pastimes become available. So, like this, Chaitanya Charitamrita is opening up a world to us. So, there's a very beautiful painting you can see, you may have seen that of the blind poet with a veena, and Krishna is right there. So there's a controversy over that painting, because some people think that's a painting of Bilba Mangal Thakur and Krishna, and some people say it's a painting of the blind poet Suradas. So one time they came, one devotee came to Prabhupada, and he said, Prabhupada, someone is saying this is Suradas, not Bilba Mangal Thakur. So Prabhupada said, yes, it's, it's Suradas. And then the devotee said, but Srila Prabhupada, you know, we've always learned that it's uh, Bilba Mangu Thakur. That's what everyone is saying. Prabhupada said, it can also be Bilba Mangu Thakur. <laughs> <laughs> he said, they are two birds of the same feather. Their pastimes are like twins. It's very interesting, actually, you look at history. Sometimes people also mix up Bilba Mangal Thakur and Suradas. Suradas was also not in the Gaudiya Sampradaya. Suradas was in the Vallabha Sampradaya, actually. Vallabhacharya, his son was Vithonath. Um, and Vithonath had eight poets 
who he wanted to produce uh, poetry that would then move people's bhakti. And he said that of those eight poets, Suradas was the leader. And so um, sometimes when you read about Suradas and Bilva Mangotagwa, they actually, it seems like they're mixing the stories. Of course, Suradas, he, he was blind from birth. And he, uh, while Bilva Mangotagwa wrote Krishna Karnamrita, Suradas wrote his, uh, it's called Sura Sabha, is it? Yeah, his poems. In Hindi or Rajabhas. Rajabhasha. So, like this, Chaitanya Charitamrita is opening us up to the world of the saints. So, maybe on this day we can take those prophetic words of Chintamani to Bilva Mangotakura. If you had that kind of determination for Krishna, imagine how far you'd be. So in those moments when we feel like I don't have determination, I don't have desire, I don't have discipline, you have it because you showed it in so many other aspects of life. Now, we just need to transfer it over and see what happens if we give it to Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Um, I guess we just spend a few, I guess some devotees need to leave, it's 9.05, just pass. I can maybe just stop and see whether if anyone has any question or any comment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for an incredible class. Maharaj, um, we often hear that the money of saints and those who are pure in consciousness and performing the process of devotional service is very empowering and you know often it comes to play whatever is said it happens in the case of Chintamani as at least what we know at the outset that she was a prostitute but it seems that the words she said carried a lot of empowerment for the Ramanga Thakur so how do we reconcile this aspect her being a prostitute and saying something and it's really struggling with the Ramanga Thakur yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I'm trying to give a whole class on prostitutes. <laughs> it said that when Krishna was walking into Dwaraka, then there were prostitutes on the, I think on the balconies, no? That's right. And they were seeing Krishna and they were great devotees. It seems that in bygone ages, sometimes it was just by chance, by some arrangement, by some yeah, some fate of nature that someone had to take up such a profession. Sometimes there were different reasons why someone may have to do such a thing. And uh, therefore we find uh, there are many, many great personalities who sometimes are even engaged in such uh, seemingly um, very uh, questionable occupations. So we don't really, I've never really read anything about the history of Chintamani and why she was uh, engaged in that profession. But clearly she had uh, so much devotion. Clearly, it's explained actually that after she told Bill the Mango Thakur that you should just go to Vrindavan, and somehow or other it's mentioned that in that moment she got the same realization. And it said that at the very same time she also just renounced everything and she just engaged in Hari Bhajan, and then she also just went to the Tirtha. So it seems that that um, devotional consciousness was latent within her, but by some fate of nature, she had taken up so, such an occupation. And as we see in other places in the Bhagavatam and other, um, other uh, pastimes, that often we find that, yeah, even prostitutes are sometimes exactly extremely elevated uh, yeah so thank you much thank you much for a wonderful class and um, you spoke about uh, the principle of being straightforward and my question was is the degree that we're straightforward different based on the relationship we have with someone So is the degree that we're straightforward um, 
based on relationship. A devotee is always straightforward. But how you are straightforward and how much you reveal of yourself may vary situation to situation. The opposite of simplicity is duplicity. <coughs> and so duplicity means to present yourself as something that you're not. And it runs very, very deep. Govinda Maharaj used to give the example, if you're in the prashadam and uh, someone comes to offer you more, and actually you want more, but you say, no, 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 it's fine. <laughs> 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 okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> even this duplicity, because you want to present yourself as something that you're not. Someone followed Srila Prabhupada around, he was a radio, uh, uh, he was not sure about holy people. And so he was hearing all oh, AC Bhakti Rans. So he said, let me follow this person around. So he followed Prabhupada around for a week. After a week, he said, this man is a saint. How, why are you going? He said, because I watched this man uh, morning to evening, and he was never trying to impress anyone. So I therefore understood this is a saintly person. So simplicity means to not present yourself as something that you're not. But that doesn't mean that to everyone you just reveal everything. So it's not that if I'm not simple, then I have scope to be duplicitous. We're always simple, but in relationship with someone, we may not reveal everything if it's not. But that doesn't mean we have to become duplicitous. You see, so there's revealing who you are, being simple and straightforward, but maybe not necessarily revealing everything. And then there's actively trying to present yourself as something that you're not. So that we should not do. But yes, in relationships, we may have to be also somewhat selective. Is that okay? eyes out, even though there was no instruction, at least we don't find any instruction from Guru to do that, <laughs> but, but he attained Krishna, so should we take some extreme action, <laughs> and when, when is that time, because Guru may give a general instruction, okay, engage in Krishna consciousness, go to Vrindavan, like that, so can you elaborate on that, can you say something about that? <laughs> um, to achieve what others don't achieve you have to be willing to do what other people wouldn't do I don't know about being extreme but it's going to take a special effort to get Krishna in this life you've got to make a special effort otherwise it's not going to happen so we sometimes see a special effort as extreme, but it's going to take something. Um, so we should make a special effort according to our capacity. Bilga Mango Thakur had the capacity to digest that kind of thing. Uh, we may not have that kind of capacity. After doing such a thing, we may slide into depression. But Bilga Mangal Thakur could digest it. He understood his capacity. He understood that now is time to do this and this is what I need on my journey forward. So yes, there is guidance from Guru Sadhu Shastra. But at the end of the day, everyone has to, inside of themselves, make the decision. Guru Sadhu and Shastra will always be there to give us uh, parameters of how we can conduct ourselves. But ultimately it's the sincerity within the heart of each devotee that will have to dictate to them how far they can go and how far they should be going. How much they have left in the tank. 
And only when you've exhausted and given everything in the tank and you've made that special effort, then maybe Krishna's mercy will descend. Unless there is that parishrama, then there is no kripa, no grace. Therefore, we are praying every single day. Mother Yashoda managed to do it because it was a full parishrama. So the point here when we hear about Bilga Mangal Thakur breaking out his eyes is not that we should do that. That would be anukarini, to imitate the activities. But what we are doing is anusharini, to imitate or to emulate the essence. And the essence is Bilga Mangal Thakur used up everything in the tank. We can say it was extreme, but from Bilga Mangal Thakur's point of view, it was just everything he could give. So in our situation, however much you hold back, the only person you're cheating is yourself. Because uh, that's however whatever you're holding back is what's keeping you between keeping keeping you away from Krishna. Someone was in a program last night and someone said, How can I get closer to Krishna? I said, What's keeping you away from Krishna? Answer that question first. Then it will be very easy to know how to get closer to Krishna. I'm simple. So, Bilga Mangal Thakur, yes, extreme, or we can say very, very special, but it has to be according to Adhikar. But we're taking guidance. Shruti, Shmriti, Purana, Di, Pancharatra, Vidim, Vena, Ekantiki, Harer, Bhakti, Utpata, Yeva, Kalpate. So take guidance. But sometimes we say take guidance, take guidance, and then we don't become individually uh, thoughtful about what it's going to take for me to get to Krishna. Because if you want to achieve what other people don't achieve, you've got to be ready to do what other people want to do. Marge, you mentioned a very, very nice uh, presentation about the journey of the hero. It reminded me on point from psychology Carl Jung, he created this theory of archetypes, where he said there's archetype of a hero, ar archetype of a villain, archetype of a, of a heroine, archetype of old man who gives the advice. And he mentioned in his theory that this is like an inherent nature of individuals to recognize these individual pastimes and to sort of actually sort of emulate them and see them and understand them. So we can see, for instance, in, in the pastime of Ramayana, and the outside world can see it in the, in the movie of you know, Harry Potter, we can see it in Lord of the Rings, we can see it all over, and we can very much recognize these pastimes. So my question is, can we say that the jiva has a natural attraction for this particular rasa? Is it something which is part of us to actually recognize these individuals and these pastimes? Uh, you mean to be a hero of these different archetypes? To appreciate them, to see their position, and to understand them. Like Lord Ramachandra is the, the good person, Vishwamitra Muni is the old senior gentleman who gives the advice, Sita Devi is the one who needs to be saved and rescued, Ravana is the villain, uh, I don't know, Sugriva, Hanuman are those which are supporting the hero. Mm -hmm. How come we have such an intrinsic nature to understand these positions and these pastimes? means everyone is an individual. Everyone expresses their devotion in different ways. When I was talking about the hero's journey, everyone will be a hero in a different way. A hero doesn't mean you necessarily become a world preacher or you become a Hanuman who like throws these big boulders into the... Uh, you can be a hero like the spider or is it a squirrel? Everyone is a hero. This is the this is the purple I was referring to. Prabhupada says every living entity is a hero in two ways. When he is a victim of the illusory energy, he works as a great hero in the material world. 
And then Prabhupada says, one can also become a hero by being a master of the senses, a Goswami. Material activities are false, heroic activities, whereas restraining the senses from material engagement is great heroism. So like if Carl Jung says that some people are an archetype of a hero, uh, we would say in Gaudiya theology, everyone is a hero. Anyone who can conquer their mind and senses is a hero. We once went to see Brahmananda Prabhu. Kadamba Maharaja told us, go and see him before he leaves this world. He's a great soul. So we went to see him. So for three hours, he was telling us pastimes of all the incredible adventures he went on to serve Srila Prabhupada. And then I looked at Brahmananda Prabhu, I said, Prabhu, what's the hardest thing that Prabhupada asked you to do? And he thought for one minute, he was silent. And then he looked at me and he said, the hardest thing that Prabhupada told me to do was chant 16 rounds attentively. <laughs> I said, you went to the Middle East, you went to Pakistan, you went to Africa, you conquered all kinds of places. The hardest thing is to conquer your own mind. Truman says that. He said, I studied the lives of great people and with each person I saw that they won many battles, but the first battle they won was the battle over their own mind. Mana, param, karanam, amanandi, samsara, chakram, parivarta, yadya. Because the Bhagavad says, it is the mind which is perpetuating material existence and our innate dissatisfaction with everyone and everything. So you've got to be a hero. And on that hero's journey, everyone falls at a certain point. Some people get the call to adventure, and it's just like, yeah, I'll do it next week. <laughs> so they don't even answer the call of adventure. But then some people get the call of adventure, and then they get, but they don't get any guidance. They don't go to a person who can guide them on that journey. So then they fall. But someone can get guidance on the journey, but then when it comes to that point where you have to go over the threshold and journey into the unknown, then they say, oh, I don't know, maybe next time. And then there are people who go over the threshold into the unknown, but then there are doubts, there are dilemmas, there are obstacles, and then they fall there. When I was a kid, they used to have this program, Gladiators. I don't know if you remember that. And in Gladiators, there was a part of the program where the person had to like run through, and there were all these things stopping them. And they just had to keep running and just going through. So the spiritual life is something like that. The hero's journey just means you have to keep going, you have to keep walking, you just have to be relentless. He said one sannyasi used to come here and his mantra was quitting is not an option. Quitting is not an option. So that's real heroic. Who's going to be that heroic to just keep going? Everyone, probably everyone in this room received the call to adventure. Now, who's going to walk that path? So one last, I think there was, yeah, okay, one last. Thing. You mentioned the word, you said the Adhika, and also <coughs> you were giving example of determination before uh, a normal method. Uh, we may be engaged in the material life with determination to achieve and they achieve to the to the degree of their adhikar or their karmic band balance. In the spiritual life also do we have as you said adhikar or the to the degree of or spiritual piety or sukrit we would have done in the previous lives. So I was thinking two ways of processing that aspect is I can be satisfied with where I am in my spiritual life. It's okay, this is my adhika. I don't think I can yes, this is the world is doing wonderful. And this is my adhika where I am, but I can also be lazy to say 
not go any beyond to stay there. So, okay. so you're saying like in material life, some people have a high adhikar to achieve in a high way, and in spiritual life, are we also having an adhikar which you know allows me to do what I can do at this moment in time? Yeah. <laughs> But you can increase your adhikar. Increase your adhikar. Associate with Vaishnavas. Immerse yourself in Pancha Anga Bhakti. Take shelter of Sri Vrindavan and Dham. Make a special effort. And maybe we'll see that our adhikar increases. Because the ultimate adhikar is that Nitya Siddha Krishna brings. The ultimate adhikar that you have is that love is already in your heart. Now all you have to do is increase your adhikar to engage in the hearing and chanting that will awaken that love. So if we're wise, we'll ask ourselves, how can I increase my adhikar? Not to say, oh, this is my adhikar. Let's go with that. Oh no, time is going. So, I have to work hard. Hare Krishna. Alright, thank you so much. There could be so many other questions, but I don't want to hold you. Shri Chaitanya Chaitanya Ki Jai. Shri Chaitanya Chaitanya Ki Jai.